Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Bram Roshberg. I'm an adult intensivist based at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And it's my absolute pleasure to be presenting today on evidence-based use of high-flow nasal cannula, the development of clinical practice guidelines. In terms of declarations, I think important to mention that I am an intensivist and, and treat patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And not only that, but I acted as the methodologist for the European Society of Internal or Intensive Care Medicine's uh, high flow nasal cannula guideline. And we'll be talking about this guideline and, and some of the methodology behind the guideline during this talk. I'm also a member of the great working group and work with a number of national and international organizations as guideline methodologists. I have no other academic or financial conflicts of interest. And despite the fact that it was, it's my pleasure to present as part of this industry innovation webinar and extremely grateful to Fisher and Paikal for the opportunity. I think it's important to mention that I received no direct funds uh, from this uh, industry or, or other industry related to high flow. In terms of learning objectives for today, we'll talk about the process for generating evidence-based recommendations. I think it's easy to say that these guidelines were evidence-based, but what does that actually mean and what goes into that? We'll, we'll talk a little bit about this. We'll talk about some of the common indications for high-flow nasal cannula and the evidence supporting the use of this device for these indications. And finally, talk about some of the recommendations that came from this guideline. I think many are familiar now with, with the device itself and how it works. It's a single limb inspiratory circuit that is able to provide high flows, higher flows of oxygen than through traditional oxygen delivery devices. When patients come in dyspneic to the emergency department, whatever the etiology of their dyspnea is, their inspiratory demands in terms of flow are very high, often in the range of 80 to 100 liters. And this is one of the main benefits of high flow nasal cannula is that it's better able to match those inspiratory demands using liters and flows up into the range of 50, 60, 70 liters, as compared to traditional oxygen delivery, non-invasive oxygen delivery devices, such as soft nasal cannula or venturi masks. One of the big complications of providing such high flows is the disruption of the nasal mucosa and the drying out of the mucosa. And that's the big reason why is that humidification is introduced uh, to help avoid this complication. And as compared to one of our more routinely used or previously used non-invasive devices, specifically here looking at non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or commonly called BiPAP, there's subtle differences when comparing high flow nasal cannula to BiPAP. When we talk about positive end expiratory pressure, this is much more easily titratable and deliverable using BiPAP. Physiologic studies suggest that some PEEP is delivered with high flow, but it's relatively heterogeneous and probably in the range of three to five centimeters of water. But to some degree, this depends on whether patients breathe with their mouths open or their mouths closed. Patients on high flow that keep their mouths closed, some of that high flow is able to generate that small degree of PEEP in the range of three to four centimeters of water. Patients that breathe with their mouths open probably losing that PEEP uh, through their mouth and that, that delivery of PEEP is impaired. Pressure support, when we talk about augmenting tidal volumes, certainly achievable using non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. However, with high flow nasal cannula, there is no augmentation of tidal volumes, no enhancement uh, of minute ventilation specifically. And as a result, the impact on CO2 clearance is more uncertain with high flow nasal cannula as compared to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more in terms of specifically hypercarbia. Although CO2 clearance is not augmented by an increase in minute ventilation, it's highly possible that that increased flow does contribute to some CO2 washout as well. No doubt the biggest benefit of high flow compared to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is the fact that it is much more comfortable as compared to any of the interfaces used for BiPAP, easier to talk, eat, uh, and uh, as because of this, as I said, much better tolerated for patients as compared to non-invasive positive pressure. 
told you we're going to spend some time today discussing the European Society guidelines. These were published in intensive care medicine in December of last year, and they addressed four questions, four indications for the use of high flow nasal cannula. One was in the setting of hypoxemic respiratory failure. Two in the setting of following extubation, the post extubation period. Three around the time of intubation and four in the setting of the uh, PACU or following an operative procedure. We'll talk about some of the methodology that goes into producing trustworthy guidelines, but for each of these questions, we performed a standalone systematic review and meta-analysis. And we were very fortunate to publish these four systematic review meta-analysis in high quality journals, including intensive care medicine, critical care medicine, and CHEST. Before we get into some of the details around these four indications, as I told you, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on what goes into producing trustworthy guidelines, because it is a relatively labor intensive process and one not to be taken lightly. <clears throat> and it was really this Sentinel publication, Clinical Practice Guidelines We Can Trust, from the Institute of Medicine in 2011 that really changed the way we produce guidelines. And we'll go over some of the central tenets that are included in producing guidelines that are trustworthy. Strict conflict of interest management is crucial. And this guideline was, was followed a strict policy, including careful vetting of both academic and financial conflict of interest and a policy for managing conflict of interest when it came up. We ensured a representative panel. This includes experts in the field, other stakeholders, and also very importantly, patients or caregivers that are included in the guideline process as well. It's important to come up with the questions ahead of time. And here we did with the four questions. We performed systematic reviews in order to summarize the best evidence addressing each of these four questions. We rated the certainty of the evidence. Some evidence bases are of higher certainty some of lower certainty, and I'll talk a little bit more about what goes into those certainty assessments. Recommendations are informed by the evidence, but there are other factors that go into coming up with recommendations, again, which we'll discuss. And finally, when you do come up with the recommendations, it's crucial to be very explicit and very clear with the guidance that's offered. This is a summary of the process. It's a famous slide, and, and I can't talk about guideline development without showing this slide. And here's the happy guideline panel in the middle. I'll tell you, they're not always as happy as the smiling faces would have you suggest, but that's certainly the goal. We start with coming up with the questions of interest, prioritizing the outcomes that we're going to focus on for the guideline. We perform systematic reviews, informing each of the questions. Then produce evidence profiles where we summarize the evidence as well as the certainty in the evidence. We bring this back to the guideline panel, which then formulates recommendations, strong or conditional for or against the intervention when considering a number of different factors. This is the 20,000 foot view. I'll spend the next five, seven minutes providing a little bit more details on this before we get to the recommendations themselves. So as I mentioned, step one is what is the question? And we frame questions as per guidelines, similar to how you would if you were creating a, a research study using PICO format, specifically describing the patients, the intervention, the comparison, and the outcomes that we're going to focus on. Picking outcomes can be sometimes challenging. And you can imagine that there's a varying degree of outcomes that are clinically important, patient important, et cetera. The focus in clinical practice guidelines is very much on outcomes that we think are important to patients. And here's where including patients and family members on guideline panels can be crucial because rather than a bunch of clinicians sitting around trying to guess which outcomes are crucial to patients, we can actually get input from patients and caregivers themselves. We rate outcomes from a scale of nine most critically important to patients to one not important to patients. And we did that for this clinical practice guideline, including a number of the outcomes that were thought 
to be important. And you can see here the results of the rating exercise. Again, nine is the highest importance, one being the lowest importance. And here was the median across the guideline panel's rating, the standard deviation, and the mean. And you can see that the outcomes that became clear were most important, that thought to be most important to patients, were death, quality of life, patient reported dyspnea, facial skin breakdown, and need for intubation. I think that generally aligns with what clinicians would think would be most important outcomes. Maybe something like patient report and reported dyspnea might not be interpreted as being as important to clinicians, but generally I think there was good alignment here with, with what we also thought were important. So we use these outcomes that were more highly prioritized as the ones that should really be informing the recommendations that we made. Once we set the PICO question, the next step was to find and summarize the best evidence. And I mentioned that this involved performing systematic reviews and meta-analysis for each of the four main questions of interest. And specifically for this project, we did not find recently completed high quality systematic reviews. So we did our own de novo starting from scratch and we're fortunate enough to publish these uh, standalone to the guideline itself. Selectively, we looked for randomized controlled trial data as this is thought to be of higher quality, higher certainty. But if we are unable to find RCT data, then we will also look for observational data. Once we've screened the literature, similar to any other meta-analysis, we evaluate risk of bias, we abstract the data from the individual studies, and then perform uh, quantitative meta-analysis if possible. When rating the certainty of the evidence, I mentioned already is that because of adjustment for confounding and, and the balance of prognostic effects achieved through randomization, RCTs are considered to start as high certainty evidence, whereas observational studies start as low certainty evidence. However, we've all seen randomized control trials that are poorly done, and we've all seen observational studies that are very well done. So there's opportunities, although that's the starting point, there's opportunities to rate down randomized controlled trials or rate up observational studies. And some of the domains that we assess the pooled evidence from randomized controlled trials for would be individual study risk of bias. So if the RCTs that we find addressing a question are all very poorly done RCTs that have significant issues with risk of bias, then we might rate down our certainty from high to moderate or from high to low. Consistency gets at statistical heterogeneity. So if all of the studies that are included in the meta-analysis all show benefit of high flow, well then we're much more likely to believe the overall results as opposed to if some studies show benefit and some studies show harm. There the discrepancy or inconsistency between studies lowers our overall certainty. Directness gets at how closely the evidence base matches our PICO question of interest. Here, we were really interested in adults, let's say, with hypoxemic respiratory failure. Imagine a scenario where all the data, although the question of interest was in adults, where all the data came from a pediatric population. Well, here we may lower our certainty for indirectness, given the fact that the data doesn't as closely match the PICO question that we were initially interested in. Imprecision is easy, the easiest to understand, perhaps, and gets at the 95% confidence intervals and sample size and the number of events and how certain overall we are based on statistical significance and the number of patients that were included. And then we also assess for publication bias. And we put this all together into what's called an evidence profile, where each row corresponds to an outcome of interest that we're interested in. Here, the example is mortality. And half of the evidence profile summarizes the pooled effect from the meta-analysis, showing the pooled relative risk, 95% confidence intervals, in both relative effect estimates and absolute effect estimates. And then the other half of the evidence profile evaluates the certainty in the evidence based on those domains that I just discussed, looking to see if there's issues in any of those domains to come up with an overall certainty of evidence. So now we've delineated our question of interest for the guideline. We've summarized the best evidence addressing this 
PICO question, and we've rated the certainty in the evidence, how do we go from this evidence summary to formulating a recommendation itself? We use something called the evidence to decision framework. This works the panel through step-by-step, step, incorporating all of the important factors into coming up with the recommendations. And recommendations include the balance of evidence evaluating benefit and harm, but that's not all that goes into coming up with a recommendation. As I said, we also take into consideration the certainty of the evidence. We might also take into consideration the cost of the intervention. Even if an intervention has benefit associated with it, if it costs a million dollars per patient that you give it to, well, that has to factor into coming up with the recommendation itself. We also consider patients' values and preferences. Patients may value certain outcomes differently than others, and that might affect the strength of recommendation. For example, anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation. Some patients may value uh, avoiding a stroke more than they may value avoiding a GI bleed. And that could, there could be variability amongst patients in how they perceive those outcomes, which might impact their overall recommendation. We also take into consideration the feasibility of rolling out the intervention, as well as any impact on health equity. And after considering these different features, the guideline panel will make a strong recommendation or a conditional recommendation. Conditional recommendations and weak recommendations are synonymous. There was translation issues with weak recommendation, especially in certain Asian cultures that had negative connotations. And we've transitioned more recently to calling weak recommendations conditional recommendations, but they're essentially the same thing. Strong recommendations are meant just do it. This is going to apply to 90, 95% of patients. There might be a small, small, small minority where it won't, but this is going to be the exception. Conditional recommendations recognize that the balance between benefits and harms are more closely aligned. And although the majority of patients would choose the, the course of action that's, that's suggested for or recommended for, there's perhaps a minority, even a large minority of patients that might choose the alternative. All right, I hope at this point you're all guideline experts and at least have an appreciation for what goes into producing trustworthy, methodologically robust guidelines. And we really went to great efforts to make sure that this guideline evaluating high flow was a trustworthy guideline in so much that those readers and stakeholders looking at it would be able to walk away and say that th these were done using the most comprehensive methodology possible. And, and we really went to lengths to ensure that was the case. And a lot of the reason why I wanted to at least spend the first um, uh, few uh, or 10 minutes going over some of the, the rigor that was involved. Let's talk about these indications in turn. We'll start with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. We performed meta-analysis looking at the use of high flow for this indication. The comparator in the majority of the studies was standard oxygen therapy using either traditional nasal cannula or uh, Venturi mask. And you can see that when you look at the outcome of mortality, four randomized control trials were included and a fairly uncertain effect on mortality. Best guess is a 6% reduction, but look, fairly wide confidence intervals. So I certainly do not feel comfortable telling you that I, I really know how high flow nasal cannula impacts mortality in the setting of hypoxemic respiratory failure. However, when we look at need for intubation, here the randomized control trials were separated based on those that were low risk of bias as compared to those that were at high risk of bias based on our evaluation using the Cochrane tool. But when you look at the overall estimates, and both low risk of bias and high risk of bias studies, fairly clear that the use of high flow nasal cannula reduces the need for intubation, our best guess by about 15%, anywhere from a 25% reduction to about a 1% reduction. And higher certainty in the fact that this seems consistent across trials and based on my clinical practice, this is what I tend to see as well. We're using more and more high flow nasal cannula these days, and I'm quite certain we are intubating less patients uh, using this modality. And, and again, reflected here based on the evidence base. We also looked at escalation of therapy. This was a composite outcome that included intubation, escalation and non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, 
or escalation of high flow nasal cannula in those patients that were randomized to standard oxygen therapy. And we see very similar results to the need for intubation, about a 30% reduction in the need for escalation of oxygen therapy when using high flow nasal cannula compared to standard oxygen therapy. We looked at complications of therapy comparing the studies that reported high flow nasal or randomized patients to high flow nasal cannula versus standard oxygen. And unfortunately, complications were too heterogeneously reported to allow for statistical pooling. But given the importance of this outcome, we still felt like it was important to, to describe it, at least narratively in tabular format, which we did here. And at least my takeaway is that the complications were relatively rare amongst both high flow and standard oxygen therapy and not dramatically different between the two arms. And in terms of a summary slide, looking at high flow in hypoxemic respiratory failure, moderate certainty evidence suggests an uncertain effect of high flow on mortality or no effect of high flow on mortality. However, low certainty evidence suggests a reduction in the need for intubation and a reduction in the need for escalation of therapy, which is not in this table. I didn't show you the forest plot, but we also had low certainty evidence that using high flow also reduces patient reported dyspnea with no differences in complications between groups. A priori, the guideline panel had identified a number of subgroups that they wanted to evaluate, including hypoxemic versus hypercapnic respiratory failure, pulmonary edema versus other causes, the role of high flow in immune compromise versus immune competent patients, mild versus severe hypoxia, and those with bilateral infiltrates versus no bilateral infiltrates. And unfortunately, the sparsity of the data here did not allow for subgroup analysis evaluating these subgroups. So certainly here, opportunity for the future in terms of evaluating or better understanding the role of high flow in these different subgroups. One potential harm that was undercaptured in the studies is the hypothesis that perhaps in those patients that are destined to fail high flow, is waiting, delaying intubation with high flow harmful to patients? Again, specifically in those that are, are going to fail, perhaps the highest of risk patients, is delaying intubation harmful? This South Korean group published now five or six years ago in intensive care medicine, evaluating or examining this exact phenomenon. They did a retrospective observational study and they enrolled 175 patients who ultimately had failed high flow and required intubation. And they compared patients that failed early as opposed to those that failed late using 48 hours as the differentiator. And in fact, they did find uh, higher ICU mortality and fewer ventilator-free days in those that failed uh, late as compared to those that failed early. So this concern or hypothesis that in the sickest of patients might we just be delaying intubation leading to harm is, is still plausible. However, obviously, given the design here, there's multiple issues with confounding and ongoing uncertainty. And I think that this is perhaps something, again, that requires further examination and further data looking at it. Challenging to study, but still perhaps worthwhile. Overall, the guideline panel, the European Society panel, after weighing the benefits and potential harms, ended up making a strong recommendation for using high flow nasal cannula in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. This was really informed by the decrease in intubation and the fact that it was believed to be relatively safe. So given a strong recommendation, again, you're all methods experts now, this means just do it. It's likely to apply to you know, the vast majority of patients. And again, this is consistent with how I practice intensive care medicine. I'd say 95% of the patients I intubate with hypoxemic respiratory failure have failed the trial of high flow nasal cannula before I do. Now there's going to be that small subset of patients that present in extremis that you don't even have an opportunity to try and it's very clear that they need to be intubated. And uh, I think it's reasonable in these cases to go direct uh, to intubation, but by far and away, the majority of patients that I intubated have, have at least had a trial of high flow uh, before intubating them. I didn't mention before, but we did find one study evaluating cost effectiveness of high flow in this setting. It was a British study, 
And although the costs of high flow are dramatically higher per device as compared to standard oxygen therapy, look, about 100 pounds here uh, in this analysis, and perhaps the cost of high flow has come down since, but 100 pounds uh, higher for the device, there was cost savings downstream in terms of intubation saved, events leading to intubation, decreased complications, and overall, using high flow nasal cannula in hypoxemic patients led to cost savings of approximately 650 US dollars per patient compared to standard therapy and 842 US dollars compared to non invasive positive pressure ventilation. So, not only perhaps effective, safe, but also cost effective. And again, this is really what informed the strong recommendation that was made. An important caveat to mention. <clears throat> This is the, again, the same pooled analysis that I showed you looking at intubation when comparing high flow nasal cannula versus standard oxygen therapy. And in the intervention arm, those that were randomized to high flow nasal cannula, 205 out of 842 patients studied ended up requiring intubation. That's almost 25%. And so uh, I, I think we sometimes get falsely reassured with high flow that these patients aren't very sick they look so well, they're able to talk and interact, um, and that we might be reassured and putting them in a less monitored environment because uh, of these reasons. And I think that the caveat here is that these patients, despite on high flow and a trial of high flow, are still very sick and likely still deserve to be in a monitored setting. This is, especially when we start talking about higher FiO2s, uh, greater than 50%, this is almost certainly life support. And perhaps I've had the experience of palliating a patient on high settings of high flow nasal cannula in so much that we take them off of the high flow nasal cannula once we're sure that they're, they're comfortable using narcotics. And it doesn't take long for them to desaturate and, and pass away. I've, I've seen very dramatic cases where the high flow comes off, patients will desaturate and, and die quite suddenly. And again, supporting the theory that that at higher flows and higher FiO2s, high flow is life support and it needs to be treated as such. And so I think if we're going to start using high flow in non-monitored settings around the ward, this needs to be done very, very carefully. I think trajectory does matter. So if a patient's on an escalating dose of flow or FiO2, or has just presented to hospital and requiring very high settings, this is somebody that even more so needs to be in a monitored setting as opposed to a patient that's perhaps on a decreasing dose of flows in FiO2, where we might feel more comfortable putting them in a less monitored step-down setting or ward-based setting. At my own institution, we actually have FiO2 limits for the ward. So if a patient's on greater than 50% FiO2 on high flow, they have to be in an intensive care monitored setting. If patients are on less than 50% FiO2, uh, they're able to be uh, potentially on the ward. And one of the tricks that we use to increase monitoring of these patients on the ward uh, is ensuring that they have close follow-up with our RACE or MET team for those centers that have access to these can be another trick or tool uh, to ensure closer monitoring. <clears throat> one of the other ways that I use high-flow nasal cannula on the ward or in less monitored settings is in patients with who are do not intubate or do not resuscitate and have this as part of their goals of care. I think high flow is excellent at managing dyspnea, whether that be terminal dyspnea or even dyspnea in patients that have limitations in their goals. And uh, I think that there's an, a high degree of role of high flow in this population, whether that be in the ICU or outside of the intensive care unit. Much was made of the role of high flow in COVID patients. And it's hard to imagine back at my own institution to March 2020, where we were petrified about putting COVID patients on high flow, given the risk of aerosolization and uh, the risk to healthcare workers that were caring for these patients. I was involved with this group that did a systematic review looking at uh, the risk of aerosolization when using high flow. There's not a lot of data out there. You're probably not surprised to hear. We found seven eligible studies, three in healthy adults, three in simulators, and one in patients with gram-negative pneumonia. And although the results were relatively variable, we found no data to support an increased risk of aerosol aerosolization when using high flow nasal cannula compared to a non-rebreather, venti mask, or traditional nasal cannula. And 
Again, as things change at my own institution now, we're still seeing a trickle of COVID patients. Perhaps the numbers aren't as high as some places uh, in the United States, but almost all of our COVID patients undergo a trial of high flow nasal cannula uh, prior to uh, pulling the trigger on intubation. And we've actually had quite a number of COVID positive patients that have required four days, five days, a week, 10 days of high flow nasal cannula and are able to, able to avoid intubation altogether uh, getting through using high flow. So it's almost a ubiquitous practice at my institution now using high flow in this population. Moving on from acute hypoxemic respiratory failure to post-operative respiratory failure. This was one of the other indications we assessed as part of the guideline. Interestingly, all of the studies that evaluated the role of high flow in the post-operative setting were done in patients following cardiothoracic surgery. We weren't able to find any studies in lower risk surgeries. And even amongst cardiothoracic surgeries, all of the studies divided the patients into those that were high risk as compared to those that were average risk. High risk patients were defined amongst the studies as either being patients that were obese, patients that had an elevated ERISCAT score, or patients with underlying lung disease. And when we look at the risk of reintubation, which this forest plot is showing, you can see amongst high-risk patients, look, a fairly consistent reduction in the need for reintubation when using high flow. And that benefit seems to evaporate in the average risk patients. Very small numbers. So my certainty in the assessment here in the role of high flow or the benefit of high flow is lower given the smaller numbers, but still a fairly consistent effect. And because of this, we made a conditional or weak recommendation to use high flow postoperatively in patients following cardiothoracic surgery with high risk features. Only a conditional recommendation given the issues with the evidence and the imprecision that existed. However, uh, fairly uh, um, consensus for this recommendation given the findings that we, that we found. One of the other main benefits of using high flow in this population as opposed to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is that patients don't necessarily require post-op ICU admission and potentially could go to a surgical step-down unit. The third question uh, we evaluated was the role of high flow nasal cannula peri-intubation for pre-oxygenation. We found 10 randomized control trials that looked at the role of high flow nasal cannula during intubation. Five of these RCTs were done in non-hypoxemic patients perioperatively, those with normal structurally lung, with no structural lung disease that were uh, coming in for elective or emergency surgery. And five of the RCTs were done in critically ill hypoxemic patients. The intervention was somewhat variable as well. Some of the studies used high flow for pre-oxygenation, but then took the high flow off for the intubation itself. Some of the studies left the high flow on actually during intubation. And, you know, as opposed to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or BiPAP, it's actually quite possible to intubate uh, with a patient with high flow still in place using either direct uh, uh, laryngoscopy or glide scope video laryngoscopy. It often doesn't get in the way and quite possible. The issues sometimes get in if you're trying to bag uh, a patient with high flow in place, uh, the seal can be sacrificed and sometimes uh, not possible. So if you are hoping to bag, sometimes you do have to take the high flow off. The comparator was somewhat variable here as well, comparing face mask, bag mask, or NIV. However, when we looked at the incidence of peri-intubation hypoxia, it did not seem like there was much difference between patients that were randomized to high flow nasal cannula as compared to control, whichever the control was, and regardless of the population of patients, whether this was ICU patients or preoperative patients. And because no difference was seen, we made no recommendation for the role of high flow nasal cannula in the peri-intubation period, essentially leaving it up to clinicians to practice as they will. The, the takeaway was there's not a, enough evidence to recommend for it, not enough evidence to recommend against it. And some of this was factored in is that patients that weren't already using high flow, the costs and resources in terms of going to get a high flow unit, there certainly wasn't enough data to support that. However, the panel recognized, and we wrote it in the rationale, is that patients that were already using high flow nasal cannula that required intubation, it was certainly very, very reasonable to leave the high flow on during intubation or using the high flow 
at the very least for pre-oxygenation and then removing it perhaps uh, right at the time of intubation. The last question that we evaluated as part of the guideline was the role of high flow following uh, planned extubation. We found eight randomized controlled trials that looked at high flow for this. All of the RCTs looked at high flow for prophylaxis rather than treatment of established post-extubation respiratory failure. We did not find any trials looking at high flow uh, for established post-extubation respiratory failure. However, I would surmise, based on what we know in non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, that perhaps once respiratory failure has developed post-extubation, these are patients that probably should just be reintubated without trying non-invasive techniques. This was uh, the Esteban trial in 2004 that showed the harm of using uh, non-invasive ventilation in this population when respiratory failure was already established. And so if you are going to use either non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or high flow nasal cannula following extubation, very, very key to use it for prophylaxis, extubate directly to these modalities as opposed to waiting until your patient runs into problems. Amongst the randomized control trials we did find when looking at prophylaxis, three were done in high-risk patients, those that were more elderly, had underlying lung disease, had a history of heart failure, obesity, high severity of illness, a previous SBT failure, or a longer duration mechanical ventilation, and five RCTs were done in low or unspecified risk patients. The high-risk studies compared high flow to NIV, the low-risk studies compared high flow to standard oxygen therapy. And when we look at the uh, results, splitting the subgroup analysis based on standard oxygen therapy and the low-risk group, as opposed to the high-risk group and NIV, you can see that compared to standard oxygen therapy in the low-risk group, high-flow nasal cannula led to a reduction in the need for reintubation, fairly consistent across the randomized controlled trials and overall about a 50% reduction in the need for reintubation. In the higher risk group, compared to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, there was no difference. The, comp the point estimate, 95% confidence intervals overlap, uh, no effect. And uh, so a fairly similar effect on reintubation compared to BiPAP. <clears throat> Although there was uh, no difference compared to BiPAP, we can surmise, and there was data to support this as well, is that high flow is likely more comfortable uh, for patients able to eat, able to interact with their environment as compared to non-invasive ventilation. And so the panel made two recommendations here in the setting of post-extubation. A conditional recommendation for high flow compared to standard oxygen therapy following extubation in patients who are intubated longer than 24 hours and have any high-risk feature. And I know what you're saying, Bram, those studies were all in low-risk patients. Why did we put in those caveats of any high-risk feature in patients that had to be intubated longer than 24 hours? I will get to that in the next slide in a moment. We also said for patients uh, who clinicians would normally extubate to BiPAP, specifically here your likely COPD patients, those with perhaps borderline SBTs, we suggested the continued use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation as opposed to high-flow nasal cannula, although recognize that there's still perhaps a role for high flow in this setting given that it is more comfortable. So although the data suggested that high flow is likely beneficial in all patients uh, post-extubation, why did we put in these caveats about any high-risk feature? Well, it all comes down to uh, relative versus absolute effects. The relative effect, this 50% reduction in reintubation when using high flow, is consistent across risk groups, or at least that's what our analysis suggested. However, the absolute reduction is going to depend, is going to vary depending on your baseline risk for reintubation. In a patient with a baseline risk for reintubation of 1%, think about here your patients with out structural lung disease, perhaps those that were briefly intubated for drug overdose. Um, uh, briefly intubated for surgery uh, and came to the ICU post-op and were rapidly extubated, the risk of reintubation in this population is very, very low. And applying a, a relative reduction in reintubation of 0.46 only leads to an absolute reduction in reintubation of 0.46%. Is it worth the cost, the headache of 
which is not monumental, mind you, but is it worth even the minimal cost and uh, issues with rolling out high flow when we're really only looking at a half percent reduction in reintubation? Maybe it is, but at least here the guideline panel felt like those that had a very, very low risk for reintubation, it was not, um, uh, there was not enough evidence to, to form a recommendation for in this population. However, as your risk of reintubation increases, 5%, 10%, 15%, 25%, you can see that the same relative reduction in reintubation with high flow translates into a larger absolute reduction in reintubation. And probably around this 5 to 10% range, the, the, the uh, costs and resources involved with using high flow are now justifiable. And it was for this reason that the panel felt like uh, putting in those caveats that specifically in patients with any high risk feature and those that were intubated longer than 24 hours, we should be extubating all of those patients to high flow uh, to reduce their risk for reintubation. Last couple of slides uh, looking at the role of high flow in hypercarbic respiratory failure. This was not an indication that was addressed by our European Society guidelines, but it's an indication that has gained interest and attention probably in the last couple of years, I would say. And fortunately, there's a group at McMaster, the institution that I work, that has recently updated the systematic review meta-analysis looking at this question. This is unpublished analysis, and hence the no camera icon at the bottom. Uh, please, uh, happy to disseminate this information, but don't take pictures of these slides. Um, the, uh, this review was led by two uh, young researcher intensivists at McMaster. Natasha Ovtarenko and Kim Lewis, up and comers in ICU, uh, both clinically and from a research perspective. They found eight randomized control trials evaluating uh, the role of high flow nasal cannula in 528 patients. Importantly, these were not severely acidotic patients, severely hypercarbic patients. Actually, the mean pH was only 7.32. So the, the most severe of patients were, were not included uh, in these studies, which is important to mention. They excluded post-extubation studies of hypercapnia, excluded tracheostomy studies with hypercapnia, and examined three outcomes, mortality, need for intubation, and change in partial pressures of carbon dioxide. In terms of mortality, relatively small numbers, Overall estimates suggest perhaps a reduction in mortality of 14%, but very, very low certainty in this estimate. You can see wide confidence intervals that go anywhere from dramatic benefit to important harm. So my takeaway is really uncertain effect of high flow nasal cannula on mortality and hypercarbic respiratory failure. Remember, we saw this in hypoxemic respiratory failure and mortality as well. So interested in intubation. Uh, again, very small numbers looking at uh, the role of high flow on intubation in hypercapnic respiratory failure. Again, the signal, the pool point estimate is on the side of benefit of high flow. I didn't mention that the comparator in a lot of these uh, studies was non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. However, again, wide confidence intervals suggesting that this could be both bene either beneficial or harmful. So hard to take much away um, for either mortality or intubation, given the uncertainty in the evidence that exists. I'm somewhat reassured that at least there's not a signal for harm. More consistent is the effect of high flow nasal cannula on CO2. This is in millimeters of mercury. It seems like a slight reduction in CO2. Again, confidence intervals do cross one, but less so. You can see the majority of the point estimate and 95% confidence intervals favoring high flow and a fairly consistent effect amongst, amongst the studies. How do I translate this into my practice? If I have a mildly hypercapnic patient on the ward with a relatively uh, uh, reasonable pH, perhaps in the, the 725, 730 range, I often will trial high flow nasal cannula before bringing them down to the ICU for BiPAP. There is some CO2 washout with the flows that I mentioned, um, and assuming that they're not, uh, again, in extremists and needing uh, immediate intubation or intervention, assuming that their pH is reasonable, I will trial high flow, follow serial gases. If I'm seeing signs of improvement, great. If I'm not seeing signs of improvement, these are patients that I'm closely monitoring and have a low threshold to either bring down to the ICU 
or apply non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or intubate. But I'm certainly comfortable based on this data uh, to trial high flow in this population. But again, given the imprecision and the data that's there, another area that is, is primed for further randomized control trials. To summarize, <clears throat> strong recommendation for hypoxemic respiratory failure. This means just do it, and probably 90, 95% of our patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure will undergo a trial of high flow, um, and that includes our COVID respiratory failure patients. Following extubation, a conditional recommendation, less certain, but probably beneficial, probably beneficial in all populations, but those that are very, very low risk, uh, maybe it's not worth the effort and time, but anybody else, there's likely benefit in uh, extubating patients to high flow. In the post-operative setting, not a lot of data outside of cardiothoracic patients, but certainly in cardiothoracic patients, extubating the high-risk folks to high flow seems beneficial in terms of reintubation. In the peri-intubation time period for the high flow, less certain, unable to make recommendations, but I think in those that are already wearing high flow nasal cannula, it would be reasonable to use it for pre-oxygenation and maybe even leave it on during intubation itself. I appreciate your attention and happy to engage uh, over social media or via email if there's any questions or concerns from here. Thanks so much.